Oh, thanks, Mark. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, it seems weird that after almost a year, I'm still doing these discussions from my desk in just outside uh, Warsaw in Poland, um, talking to the world. I've actually been, been running workshops and doing keynote addresses on a regular basis uh, for the past nine months. But um, it's not the same as when you're networking together one-to-one, -one, face to face. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting dialogue that's been something I've been debating quite a lot over the past nine months, which is, can you truly replace all the physical connectivity that we enjoy with digital? Or what role does digital play in the mix of how we connect and interact with each other? And my conclusion, in fact, I've just been running a survey about this that's had um, over 350 people respond, so it's been quite a good survey, is that um, you need physical. You, you can't just do everything digital, which may sound strange from a digital guy, but um, it's pretty clear from all the surveys I've been running. And in fact, I've been um, doing quite a bit of research online surveys because that's the way in which we connect this year. Um, and from all of those surveys, it's it's really obvious that um, purely digital doesn't work. Now, I've known that before, and for those who thought I was purely digital before, I never was. I've always actually said you have to keep branches, for example, in the financial network. And I've never said that we will be a branchless society and that banking can be done without branches. Um, there are other people who do say that, but I, I've never said that. And the reason I've never said it is because um, there's a number of factors that come into play and they've been heightened this year by what's been happening to all of us. For example, psychologically and emotionally, money is about human connectivity. It's actually one of the most emotional and psychological areas of our lives that gives us strength or weakness. If we have a good financial capability, then our worries are much fewer than those who are living day to day, hand to mouth. And that particularly, I think, has come home this year because there's a very strong integration between financial wellness and mental wellness which I don't think we've understood well enough because we've lived for the last century in building a credit bubble that's burst. And now we're dealing with the credit bubble and we're trying to work out how to deal with people who are living day to day, hand to mouth. And there's actually an opportunity there for FinTech because FinTech can look after people who are worried about money. There's been quite a lot of innovation that I've seen in not just fintech startups, for example, helping local communities in dealing with the challenges of lockdown. A good example being a couple of fintech companies in the UK that were trying to help local businesses by you buy vouchers today to spend tomorrow with those businesses and that keeps those businesses afloat but one of my favorite examples of financial wellness dealing with mental wellness is the elderly and the fact that we have a lot of people today who are stuck at home they can't go out they can't shop they may be in their 70s or 80s or 90s they may have dementia or parkinson's disease or alzheimer's they may have other issues Hopefully they have neighbors or friends or family who can help to look after them. And in that context, I think the thing that happened very early in this lockdown where a card for friends connected to your account that you could top up and load was really useful. But it's only useful, and if you didn't catch that one, by the way, it was from Starling Bank. It was a card that you could get as an extra card to give to your neighbor, your friend, or your son or daughter or, or family to do your shopping for you. But another one that I thought is particularly interesting is those who are dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's, um, being able to have 
friends and family who can connect to their accounts and get alerts of an unusual account activity. You know, if your grandma or grandpa or father or mother or brother or sister opened 15 credit cards in a week, you would probably want to know about that. And there are now lots of things happening in technology and in the technology space that's helping in that area. And I think this is one of the things that for me has been the most eye-opening aspect of 2020, which is we've all become digital, but we still need physical. But the digital connectivity has been exceptional. The fact that we can do conference calls on video and we didn't do them before March. You know, I now sit here quite often. I go, why do you want my video on? Because you know, before March 2020, I could just do a conference call on the telephone. I'm not dressed for a video call. You know, suddenly we've all moved to video connectivity in just a few months. Zoom went from 10 million active users in December 2019 to 300 million in April 2020. That's incredible. It's incredible. In fact, it's interesting to see their share price has just gone down considerably because there's now a vaccine that's been found potentially to the pandemic. Because we recognize that we still need to be physical. We still need to travel. We still need to network. We still need to meet. Uh, and that will never go away. But the fact we've had that ability for nine months to meet online virtually and trade and connect and deal and invest and save and spend and get everything online for nine months, I think has changed behaviors fundamentally forever. Some people disagree with me, but I think we've seen a fundamental change to our world where we will never go back to the way we traveled and networked before but we will still travel and network. We'll just do it a lot less than the way we did it before because we've now learned in our world that we can do things virtually and it works. It doesn't work 100% all the time forever, but for 80% of the time, it's good enough. So when I look out at the next couple of years, um, you know, the travel industry will probably not recover for four or five years, if it ever recovers to the way it was, which I'm not sure it will. Um, the restaurant and hospitality industry uh, and the conference and exhibition industry will also struggle, um, but probably will recover sooner, maybe in two or three years. What does it mean for banking and fintech and finance? Well, basically it means that we're gonna see some massive changes. Um, if you read my blog, which I hope you do at thefinancer.com. Um, I'm writing every day about my observations. And one of my major observations right now is I think there's gonna be a massive change once the vaccine is in place in banking and FinTech in everything in our world. But the major change in banking and FinTech is I think there's an awful lot of people who are really angry with their financial institution right now. I'm one of them. And the reason why I'm angry is that my financial institution uh, had most of its customer service offshore and it shut down with four hours notice and suddenly I couldn't contact them and they didn't have a backup. So equally that their challenge was Offshore services had disappeared. They couldn't create an onshore service in the UK because that was also shut. They were a disaster, a mess. They were just completely useless. And they've been that way, to be honest, since March. So when the great unlock happens, I think we'll see fundamental shifts of consumers away from those who failed in the pandemic to those who succeeded. And those who succeeded are the ones that are truly digital. And I guess this is my final part of my opening here, which is what does truly digital mean? Well, truly digital means you're digital at the core of the institution. You provide omni access. You don't talk about omni channel. Channel is what you layered on top of old rubbish. 
and it failed. Omni Access is where you have a digital core that's open to all via whatever device people want to use. It's a little bit like we saw during the summer, an awful lot of traditional incumbent banks making commitments to be using cloud-based services because they had to, because their employees were at home, their customers were at home. They were forced to move to cloud, but they're not cloud native, they're cloud-based. And there's a radical difference between cloud native and cloud-based. Cloud-based is like omni-channel and digital on top. You just added that to what was there before because you had to. Whereas cloud native digital at the core is actually where you created a business, a financial institution that was born for the internet, the mobile, the digital age. And that's what I've been advocating for many years now, as you'll know from my writing and my books, if you've read any of my books or my blog, you have to be born on the internet today to be fit for purpose. And I, there's an awful lot of institutions that proved they were unfit for purpose this year, 2020. And if they don't get an act sorted very quickly, I don't think they'll be around in 2030. So that's my opening. I could talk for hours. Um, anyone who knows me knows I can talk for hours, but I don't want to keep you here any longer. I'll hand back to Mark and Jason.